is the vice president of the National Border Patrol Council to get to. Chris Cabrera is the vice president of the National Border Patrol Council and local 3307 in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. He is on the front lines of what's happening there, and we know that the government, our government, has clamped down on many Border Patrol agents speaking to the press and urging them, warning them, I should say, they are not to bring cell phones into detention facilities. They don't want more photos released to the public. And we heard from one individual uh, yesterday that shifts are being changed, Border Patrol shifts. In other words, if someone who they think has loose lips is operating on a, on a shift where a congressman or other state official is to show up, well, that individual uh, Border Patrol agent will be changed to a different shift. So this is... What we're getting, dribs and drabs, but not transparent at all. And Chris Cabrera joins us. Chris, it is good to have you on, sir. Um, with so much news on the foreign policy front, where we're you know, gnashing our teeth about what's happening in Iraq with ISIS, the border of Iraq being overrun, uh, for the people who have somehow not been following this issue, tell us today what our border in your region looks like, what the flow into the country is like. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, right now it's probably the most porous that it's ever been. Uh, just earlier today we had a group of 280 women and children turn themselves in at, at one time. Today? Already? Uh, yes, ma'am. Probably uh, about 8 o'clock this morning. Uh, they uh, were rounding up. They, I guess, uh, one of the guys said that they had stopped. They had lost count at 280. They had to do a recount, but uh, at 280, they lost count. They were loading everybody up in vans. That they had just walked up, turned themselves in, and uh, were ready to go. <laughs> um, there's so much I want to ask you, but the number one thing I want to ask you, Chris, is when did the policy change, and who changed it? Right. When people cross the border, traditionally, they are turned back across the border, right? They are turned back. I'm not talking about unaccompanied minors. There, there are many, many adults crossing this border right now. I mean, I, I hear from some of your colleagues. You know who they are. We won't say who they are. Uh, but they're saying, look, people are making this out to be just unaccompanied minors. And the minors are usually 15 years old, median age, something like that. But not like two-year-olds are crossing the border by themselves for the most part. Um, so it used to be that people were turned back. When did that directive come down that that would not be the policy any longer? Well, you know, it, it's still the policy depending on where you're from. If you're from, say, Mexico, obviously Canada, we don't really see too many problems out of those guys, but we share a land border. So in order to turn them back, we just have to take them to the, uh, the port of entry and, and send, them, send them back along their way. However, if they're from a uh, other than Mexican country, um, it, it's a little more difficult because we just can't put them on a bus and drive them through Mexico um, because Mexico won't allow that. But so how do we, we know? But how do we know, Chris, who these people are? I mean, they say I'm so and so from uh, you know San Salvador, San Diego, in San Salvador. But how do you know they're from San Diego, the, La Playa, in El Salvador? How do you know that? Yeah, you know, you really don't. Uh, obviously, they're going to have some form of ID. We, our, our agents are pretty good at, at interviewing these people and, and getting them, breaking them as to what their, their country of origin is, just through a, a series of questions. Um, but then again, nothing is, is 100% along those lines. We have had people in the past claim to be from uh, OTM, other than Mexican countries, when they're actually uh, uh, Mexican nationals. Obviously, um, that's probably more or less probably to come. But um, you don't you don't know 100 um, percent. You, you kind of go based on what the information they provide and what they have with. OK, so now you have just this just this morning, for people listening to this show across the country. Understand this. We're seeing, you know, this disaster in Iraq unfolding. ISIS taking over an oil field today. All these security concerns crossing other people's borders. We have 280 uh -huh. people crossing our border today who are just turning themselves yeah. in. I mean, this is. Yeah. And that was just uh, just that was just at the um, uh, at the beginning of, of the day. You know, usually we're going to have a lot of turn-ins uh, at the beginning of the day because uh, it's not too hot out there. This is and then we'll have it again at the Chris, end of the day. Chris, I don't know how you guys. I mean, honestly, how you guys show up at work every day when when you have a number one thankless job, 
you can't really do your job, really. I mean, you're now. You, I know a lot of the border agents I've spoken to. They, they're, they're, they're wonderful people. First of all, I mean, this is, it's not like you get rich on this job either. Believe me, you're not getting rich. They're, they're turning into, you know, uh, USAID. I mean, you guys are turning into. You know, you're handing out the baby formula and, and making sure that the, the that sippy cups are here and then the other people have their diapers. And, I mean, that's not what you guys really signed up for. I mean, occasionally you'd have to do stuff like that. But this is what's taking up a lot of the agent's time now, just the humanitarian processing, again, of the OTMs, the other than Mexicans. Yes, uh, you're, you're correct. It, it's very frustrating for our agents to go through this. Um, you know, and so much of our resources are being diverted from uh, doing what we're actually supposed to be doing. Um, we're, we're having a lot of people get through uh, on on our on our flanks that that we patrol because of lack of manpower. And you know, the number out there before has been that the border is secure, that we're at eighty percent or ninety percent uh, success rate in apprehensions. When in actuality, we're we're lucky to be in the thirties. So you're only. You're all, of those 280 that turned yourself that turned themselves in, that's about 30 percent of the people who are crossing. You think? Just at that you one know, point. You know, I, I believe so. You know, we, we the, the border patrol historically has been um, really good at uh, at hiding the, the true number of, of people that get away. And you we're, we're they focused don't. so much. Yes, we're, we're focused so much on on what's going on. And obviously, when you have children, you you have to divert attention to them because. They are fragile emotionally, physically. You you have to treat them a certain way and, and make sure their needs are met. But then at the same time, you have so much going on that's getting past us on on the on the flanks that the people that are trying to get away, that the drug smugglers, the, the criminals that that have reason to run, obviously they're not going to turn themselves in, and that's what we're missing out on. We're talking to Chris Cabrera on National Border Patrol uh, Council uh, Vice President. Um, well, uh, so Chris. That, uh, go back to these directives. I want to find out, like, who made the decision to get the buses, to fly the people to these different areas. Uh, obviously, they can't all be processed in one area or held in one area in Texas. That's part of the, you know, the overwhelming of the border. But who, who was it, or was it DHS, or when did the order come down uh, that the disbursement would occur that, through flights and buses and so forth? You know, they've been pretty um, pretty good at keeping us in the dark of that. I, I would say probably in the last maybe a, a month or so, we had been warning them that, that we were getting overrun and nobody seems to take note up on the DHS level. Um, and since that, you know, now they finally, I guess they've seen the pictures, the photos got leaked somehow, and now they, they see that, yes, there is a problem, and now we're, we're trying to play catch up and, and, and do something that we should have done months ago. Are there whistleblowers within the Border Patrol ranks who could, frankly, really blow the lid off of what's going on here? I mean, I, I'm looking for whistleblowers here. I mean, you're a truth teller. You just, I mean, we've talked to you before. I mean, you just say this is what we're seeing. This is what we're dealing with, and, and you have every right to, you know, relate that information. So many Americans don't even realize what's going on. That's what's shocking. People come up to me going, what are you talking about with Texas? I said, haven't you followed this? No, my local news isn't doing anything on this, except for in the occasional story of the of the of the nice kids from Guatemala who found found a match family in Washington D.C. and they're sweet and they're nice and they're settling in. You, you see those kinds of stories, but you don't see the stories of oh my gosh, we don't know who a lot of these people are, and they say they're from here. They could be, they could have drugs on them. They could have gang affiliation and and so forth. So could could we see whistleblowers coming forward to talk more frankly about this? You know, I, I think we could. Um, however, um, the patrol has done a lot to intimidate agents from, from speaking out. Up until about maybe three years ago, four years ago, you never, you would have never seen a, a border patrol agent in any shape or form, whether it's anonymously or 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 out of the public, saying what's going on. And I guess now people have gotten so fed up with what's going on that people are willing to come out and speak. But you know, you saw. I'm sure you saw that story where. They put out that if, if any border patrol agents caught speaking to the media, they could face administrative or criminal action, which is crazy. Um, you know, because the people have, have the right to know what's going on, and if they don't want these pictures to be seen, instead of trying to cover up what's going on, they should just clean it up. And once it's cleaned up, then there's no bad picture to be.
dedicated bankers born to go the extra mile. You've been such a big help. This is what I like to do. So you can choose a bank where helping people comes first. Chase, so you can. Um, our total focus is on Portugal now. You know, Ghana is far away from us already. That's all, all, all out of our minds. You know, we knew it was very, very important to get that, uh, uh, those three points. You know, we worked hard for it. You know, it was a very tricky game, as you all you know, saw. But we, our mindset is 100% uh, on Portugal. I mean, personally, for me, uh, the, the win three points was huge. But, I mean, to go, that it goes through our minds, I don't think so. I mean, Portugal is going to be a tough game, another tough game. And it's football. Anything can happen. Uh, based on past World Cups, sometimes four points isn't even enough. So